Lifetime original movie. Are your parents home? This is my friend's house. Ripped from the headlines. Kara's gone missing. Somebody must have taken her. Based on a true story. Wait. Now, Kara, there are rules. And when you break the rules, there are consequences. Escape. Do everything that I tell you to do. Survive. He's likely killed at least three girls. Any sign of him? Wait. Escape. Survive. Escape. Find this son of a bitch. This is a serial killer of little girls. Survive. You know, I'm not looking to hurt you. Not if you don't make me. The Girl Who Escaped, the Kara Robinson story. Premieres Saturday, February 11th at 8 on Lifetime. All right, we are on our last panel for today um, with the executive producer of The Girl Who Escaped, the Kara Robinson story, Elizabeth Smart, along with Kara Robinson Chamberlain herself. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Hi. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we'll go to Jay Bobbin from Grace Note. Jay Bobbin, please unmute your mic. Thank you very much. Hi, ladies. Elizabeth, my question is for you. I know you've had a connection to Lifetime for a while, and I know it kind of, I want to say comes and goes, and that's not the way I mean it, but it's not a steady connection. It's as the project comes up. How does it work? Do you find a story, or do you see a story or know of one that you bring to them, or do they suggest something to you, or does it work both ways? Um, I would say it works both ways, but it's always very important for me for any project that I take on. I mean, whether it's executive producing anything or um, really anything is that the survivor has their voice and it's respected and they're able to tell their story the way that they want to. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Up next, we have Fred Topple. Fred, please unmute your mic. Hi, Topel, uh, Elizabeth and Cara, um, since you've, uh, as executive producers of this, since you've both been through real life ordeals, what are some things you wanted to make sure were in the movie to convey uh, the sort of situations you'd been through? Cara, if you want to go first, I'll, I'll follow after you. Yeah, sure. I think for me, what is important is telling a story, like Elizabeth said, that's authentic to what I actually experienced. But also one of the things that Elizabeth and I have both identified in our journey towards healing and being survivors of, you know, crime stories is that we did not see anyone in the media that was experiencing a traumatic event in the way that we were experiencing it. So for me, I think what's most important is telling a story that might look a little different, how I responded, how I reacted than some of the stories you've seen on television, because ultimately I know that I'm not alone in how I responded to my particular trauma. And so the ability to tell a story that looks a little different um, is what's most important for me. Can you get a little specific about those differences, just one or two things that uh, will really uh, resonate with the audiences to convey uh, what it was like for you? Yeah, sure. So for me, um, you know, this was 20 years ago, but the only responses that I had seen sort of in media portrayed was this extremely, I'll say traumatized reaction of having PTSD or having anxiety attacks, having nightmares. And that was never something that I identified with personally. Um, immediately following my kidnapping, I felt like I was, I use air quotes, I felt like I was fine. And that was sort of a, a story that I perpetuated for about 15 years. Mm, interesting. And Elizabeth? Um, I felt like, I feel like sharing stories, I mean, it's such a powerful tool um, and making sure that we are authentic to the voice of their survivor is so key. But as I have gone out and as I've met with other survivors and listened to their stories, actually so many of them have been influenced by stories that they've seen on, on the media. Um, I mean, I have a very good friend even right now who, um, had broken his leg and he was lying in bed um, watching uh, Law and Order SVU and a story came up and it was 
I mean, it wasn't him, but it was exactly what had happened to him. And up until that moment in his life, it had never struck him that what had happened to him was sexual abuse until he saw this particular episode. And so I feel like these stories are so powerful to help allow other survivors know that they're not alone because the crimes of sexual violence, they are so um, isolating. It's so easy to feel alone. To know, so to know that they're not alone, to know that they, they don't have to be ashamed and they don't have to feel like they needed to keep it a secret, um, whether it's you know, something that happens on like a very intimate small scale or something that's large that the maybe the whole world knows about but I want them to know that they they don't need to be ashamed of it they don't need to keep it a secret and to know that you you can move on and I feel like Kara's story illustrates that beautifully well, thank you both for being here thank you Fred up next is DG from the core 94 radio station DG, please unmute. There you go. Yes, hi. My question is for Ms. Kara Robinson. How are you? I am good. Yes, can you tell me about the strength that you found or did you had to find to be to survive? And you know, what what does that take, you know, for us humans? Because they say it takes a, a traumatic experience or or something basically life-threatening. Like, could you tell me where you gathered that from and where you said, okay, this is it, and I'm not gonna be a victim, I'm gonna be a survivor? Can you tell me what happened? Absolutely. So I think it comes from two places. Uh, the first is I am actually just a very strong-willed, stubborn person. And I decided pretty quickly that I did not want this person that took me captive to have any more control over me than I than he possibly could. So anything I could do to maintain control. So that was kind of me remaining calm. That was me escaping. And that was me going forward and not being a victim, so to speak. And then the second part for me was absolutely just my trauma response. You know, you hear fight or flight very often, but it's been expanded a little bit more. Whenever you're under stress, we now say fight, flight, freeze, and appease. And so um, that is something that's in all of us whenever we face a traumatic situation. And so I, I share that with people as a way to sort of empower them that it's actually something that's within all of us. I think a lot of us hear stories like this and myself included, I hear stories of other people who have done amazing things. And I think, my goodness, I don't know if I could ever do that. And then I realized that they were responding, their trauma response was beneficial to them in that moment. And I've already experienced something similar. So um, it's one part stubbornness and one part survival mechanism. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your testimony. And thank you, Ms. Smart, and for all the great things you're doing with Lifetime and bringing awareness to the situation. Because more times than awful, they always talk about the tragic end and not um, a joyful end and, and how you can fight back and bring more awareness to the situation. So thank you so much. I'm a huge fan of Lifetime. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, up next, we have G Hala. Hey, good evening. Good afternoon to you all. Um, what advice could you give for uh, post victims as well as uh, future victims? I always believe in preventative measures like you know, cameras, GPS trackers, probably put those in places where people possibly won't look, like maybe inside of your children's shoes or have it sewn or weaving somewhere where if something happens and they disappear, you're able to you know, create some type of link to try to figure out you know, what generalized area they may be. Are you guys, um, how do you feel about that? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that taking, I, I agree. I think we should all be focusing on prevention because there are steps that we can take. And honestly, some of the very simplest steps are just starting that conversation at home and within our own communities and make sure that we, we are being aware and we are addressing, you know, those very common situations. I mean, Kara and I, our stories are honestly the exceptions and not the norm because both of us were kidnapped by, by strangers and both of us were abused by strangers. And what happened to us came at the hands of strangers. Whereas the vast majority of cases that take place um, of sexual abuse, of violence, of kidnapping, um, they are typically someone that is known to the victim. So starting out with your kids within your own home from a very young age, talking about 
um, what's safe, what's okay. I'm helping them to know that what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what to do if they don't feel uncomfortable, if they don't feel comfortable, if they feel, wow, am I speaking to you correctly? Um, but what to do and letting them know that you, you are their backup, you are there for them and you will support them and you will believe them. Um, taking them to further their education, whether that is um, getting them into a self-defense class or um, having them practice um, with whatever safety um, measure you deem appropriate for your child. Because if you just hand them, I mean, I remember, <laughs> this is not funny, but a little bit funny. Um, my, my parents gave my sister and I pepper spray when we were young, it was right after I was rescued and they wanted us to carry it around in our backpack all the time and they handed it to us. And my big brother, he snatched it. And I mean, he'd never had pepper spray and he was looking at it and he was like being a silly big brother. And he accidentally sprayed my mom in the face with pepper spray. And um, so making sure that your kid actually knows how to use it um, has, has, experimented with it safely um, in a controlled environment. I mean, these are all things that you can do that are very basic, easy places to start with. Um, Kara, if you have anything to add, you just jump right in. Yeah. yeah, I will agree with everything Elizabeth said. This is actually something that she and I talk about um, somewhat regularly. And the one thing that I will add is that we all know that as humans, very often we experience difficult things in our lives. So for our children's or for, uh, for our children's kind of, I guess, future proofing um, and for anyone who is afraid of being a victim, I think the best thing that you can do is have coping skills and teach your children coping skills. Because at some point your children, if you know, you're, you're thinking about protecting them at some point, they're going to go through something difficult. Um, and you as a human, at some point you're going to go through something difficult. So the ability to teach your children or teach yourself coping skills, uh, is something that I think kind of keeps you from being quote traumatized as much. I use that very lightly, but um, you know, things like how do we deal with stress? Who are safe people that we can talk to? Um, you know, what is comfortable or not comfortable in my body and kind of prepare yourself and your children for situations. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions, but this has been a great participation. So thank you all. Um, up next, we have Angela Brown. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, Angela Brown, Grinders 24-7 Magazine TV. Um, this question goes out to Elizabeth Smart. Um, being that you were a part of this um, movie here, this Lifetime movie, did it bring back memories of what happened with you when you was abducted? And I do have a second question. Um, how much of a role did God play in your life in order for you to stay sane throughout your abduction? Um, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, I've known Kara now for, I don't, I don't even know how long it's been. It's been years and we've had a lot of time to, um, to talk and it's gone both ways. We've talked about my story. We've talked about her story. Um, so the initial, I mean, talking through it, reading through it, um, it was, I'm not going to say it wasn't emotional because it's, it's emotional contact. Like I care deeply about Kara. She's a good friend. Like I, I, I love her a lot. Um, so it, it was emotional, but then actually seeing someone try to make that story come to life I mean see it act out that is a very emotional experience um, sometimes to the point of me needing to like pause it for a couple of minutes and like walk away for a minute because because it is emotional and and knowing that you know this this is a this is a real story this is my friend this is my friend this is my friend's life this is what she went through um it is emotional um I wouldn't say so much that it's like um 
triggering for me um, and my story, but I certainly remember the feelings of what it was like to go through that. And um, I mean, anything, it just like, it just makes me care deeper for Kara and respect her. I mean, I already thought my respect couldn't go any deeper for her, but I mean, watching it just brings it to another level, if that makes sense. And then to your second question, um, I believe God has always played a part in my life and um, was absolutely a huge source of comfort to me uh, while I was kidnapped and, and ever since then. Yes. Thank you so much and God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our last question for today is going to be from Lavetta Jenkins. Lavetta, please unmute your mic. Thank you. I am uh, fortunate enough to be old enough to remember when both of these cases was fresh. And I've always wondered about you two, but I wanted to ask, what really were you holding on to in those moments that uh, brought you out in victory? I saw in uh, The Girl Who Escaped, Kara really was detailed in all of the information. And it, was only, it wasn't even a long time that you were away from your family. But how did you manage, both of you, to hold on to little things that eventually led to the capture of your uh, abductors? I think for me, it was, it goes back to a little bit of that trauma response where, you know, you see amazing things uh, whenever someone is under immense amounts of stress. Right. And so for me, I'd never considered myself to have like a strong memory or anything like that, but under immense amounts of stress, I was able to memorize a lot of facts. And then I sort of had this mantra, which you see a little bit of in the movie of just remain calm, gather information, find a way to escape. And so for me, it was just kind of ruminating on those things because there was a lot going on that I had no control over. But what I did have control over was my ability to kind of compartmentalize what was happening, kind of put that somewhere else in my mind. And I was able to gather information, um, gain this person's trust a little bit and gather information and eventually escape. So those were the things that helped me. And I mean, I would, I'd agree with Kara. Um, initially it was, it was trauma response. Um, I mean, I was, I was gone for nine months. So it did just eventually turn into what happens if I don't do this? What happens if I do this? Will I survive? Will I like, will I live to see another day if I, if I do this? And um, that's, I just kept asking myself that question all the time. And that's how I made my decisions. That's how I, um, gauged whether or not I should try to make a break for freedom or if I should continue to do what they were saying. Um, that's, I mean, that's really what my life came down to was, will this help me survive? Will I die if I don't do this? And that's, that's what I did. I am very thankful that both of you were able to hold on and that you are here with us now. Thank you so much for this movie. I appreciate both of you. God bless you in the future. Thank, thank you. you. Well, that is a wrap on today's panel. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Again, The Girl Who Escaped, the Kara Robinson story premieres Saturday, February 11th at 8, 7 central on Lifetime.